Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another episode of our Aquarium Online Academy. I'm James from the Education Department here at the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach. I have Jen and Dana helping control the computer so they can show off all the cool animals behind us here on the screen. And Emily is over in the office helping to answer and relay some of your questions. Like every Online Academy pre presentation we have, you can text in questions to us if you want to learn more about a particular subject. So at 562-286, 1838, you can text us questions. We just surprised Emily a little bit. <laughs> if you heard extra stuff, we were listening to other things and we left that on and we scared Emily. Sorry, Emily. <laughs> That's okay. That's the kind of fun we have here in the studio. But don't forget, you can ask us questions about all the topics that we are talking about. Now, if you're not watching live, you can still ask us questions. So if you're watching at a later date than was uh, aired or that was recorded, Email us down here at live at lbaop.org and you can ask us your questions. All right, so let's get started talking about birds. Today, we're going to be talking about puffins to penguins. Well, it's the same letter of the alphabet, so what does that mean? Well, we kind of styled it because puffins live in the northern hemisphere and penguins live in the southern hemisphere. So we're going to cover birds across the whole planet. Now, that's a lot of birds. There's a lot of species of birds. So we're going to try and highlight some of the really interesting ones that we have living here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. Let's start with those very northern funny, uh, funny looking birds, the puffins, because they're not really different than any other bird, but they have some very interesting styling. So I tried to make my hair look just like this one. No, this is a tufted puffin. So they have feathers that look kind of blonde or yellowy and they push back over their head. Now, if you notice some other things in the tufted puffin, let's make some observations together. What can we see on the tufted puffin? I noticed that they have lots of black feathers. Why would they have so many black feathers? That's a good question. Hmm. We'll come back to that. They have very bright feet and a bright beak. All right, well, let's look at the other kind of puffin and see if we can make some comparisons. Now, the other puffin species that we have that lives here is called the horned puffin. Now, they have feathers that are kind of styled similarly to the tufted puffin that are just on their head, but are right above their eyes, and it makes them look like they have little tiny horns. Now, the horned puffin has some similarities and some differences that we should make notice of. So what do we see is different about this one? There's white feathers on their belly. So the tufted puffin had all black. This one has black and white. Now this color pattern, we'll see again. I'm trying to make the bird bigger for you guys. There we go. This bird has a type of camouflage called counter shading. The tufted puffin had all black feathers. So if you're all black in your feather coloring, you could probably hide in a dark zone pretty easily. Now these are diving birds. They do dive into the water to feed. They aren't going to do the same kind of diving as, say, a heron does. We'll get to them in a little bit. But they can dive, and they can, I believe, go down over 150 feet to collect their food. So that's pretty cool. But what else do we notice about the tufted puffin versus the horned puffin? Their beak is different. There's still some orange and yellow in the beak, but it's a little bit different color pattern. And right here above the, uh, there we go, right here above the eye, that is that feathery part that looks like horns. All right, so that's the northern diving bird. Now the interesting thing about puffins and penguins is that they have the same ecological role called a niche. It means what they do. What do they eat? What are they doing in the environment? What's the relationship with the other species around them? And since they're a diving bird, they do dive for different kinds of fish. There's others in the what's called the auk family, where the puffins are at, that will dive and eat krill. So the uh, pigeon guillemot and the little crested auklet have a little bit different diet, a little bit different body style. Let's see if we can take a look at another diving bird like the guillemot or the crested auklet. What do we have for that? Hey, here's the pigeon guillemot. So it's still a diving bird. It's, a, it's in the auk group, but it's, it's not a pigeon. It just kind of looks like the shape of a pigeon. Now, these birds have a little bit different body style than maybe the birds we think of outside our door, in our neighborhood, in a forest. Those birds fly just like these do, but these birds can dive. So their bodies are a little bit more dense, meaning uh, for the same size, they're a little bit heavier. So density is a measure of how far apart things are. So if you have, let's say, 10 jelly beans, 
and you spread them out over this much space. There's that's a lot of jelly beans in this much space, but if you scrunch them up, it's the same number of jelly beans, but they're all tight next to each other. That's a higher density. So the same number of stuff, but in a smaller amount of space is how you're going to measure density. So their bones are more dense. There's more bone material in the same size of bone. So it makes them heavier to dive. So they have a little bit more density than a flying bird that never dives in the water. But they're not quite as heavy as a penguin, which doesn't fly at all. Now we'll get to them in a little bit. But let's take a look at the crested auklet. I think we have a picture of the auklet, right? We do. Aha! I love them because they have those very special feathers right here. They're very fashionable. They have colors similar to the puffins and the guillemot. We have an orange beak. They have this white stripe behind their eyes, but their feet are dark. That's a little bit different than the other birds we've looked at so far. Now, the cool thing about these birds, like a lot of birds, is that they change colors seasonally. So they'll have different plumage or feather coloring at the summer season versus the winter season. And some of this is for reproductive purposes, so they can attract a mate. Some of this is for where to hide or camouflage in the winter. So a lot of birds do change colors for a lot of different parts of their life cycle. And it depends on if they're migrating, if they need to attract a mate, if there's a lot of different reasons to change colors. But then there's other birds that really don't change colors ever. And they live here at the aquarium. They're very noisy birds. But they're very cute. These are the rainbow lorikeets. So all the birds we've talked about so far are northern kind of arctic subarctic birds. Temperate to kind of really cold. Does this bird look like it lives in the really really cold habitat? Mm, no, probably not. Because if they were sitting in the snow, they'd be pretty easy to find. Now they can be kind of feisty, but that's not a good adaptation if it's easy to find you. Because predators are looking for things. So unless you are more feisty than the predators, you need to be able to hide sometimes. So where do you think this bird would hide? What has all these really bright, beautiful colors they can hide in? A rainforest. These birds are coastal rainforest birds in Australia, Papua New Guinea, the Solomon Islands. They've recently been introduced to New Zealand, probably accidentally. Now, the funny thing about New Zealand funny cool that way is that New Zealand is a special island because there's a lot of species that have shown up in New Zealand that weren't supposed to be there but instead of becoming invasive and damaging to the environment a lot of the species have just kind of become part of the environment so New Zealand keeps increasing its diversity just by accident because some species show up there but it adapts in a way that the island and all the other ecosystems they can coexist there without damaging the environment all right that was a fun segue not really that was a side Sidebar. All right, let's talk about more of the lorikeets. We have three three parts here. The, there's different subtypes of rainbow lorikeets. We have three that live at the Aquarium of the Pacific. So we have the Swainson's lorikeet, which is this one. And the reason I know that is because of the coloring right here in the chest. We have the green-naped lorikeet, which is the one behind me here, right there. Now, the nape is like the back of your neck, like right here. So they have green on the back of their neck. Well, a lot of them have that, but they also have these orange and almost black stripes on their chest. And then there's the Edwards lorikeet, which has an all yellow chest. And these are just a few of the types of rainbow lorikeets. These subspecies happen because of what's called crossbreeding, where maybe a green nape and a Swainson have a few babies, and there's some color changes that happen because of that. It's almost like having a breed of a dog, but not exactly. So there's also different species of lorikeet. This is the rainbow lorikeet, and uh, there's a video of our rainbow lorikeets, a quick little jaunt through our lorikeet aviary. And in the aviary, there's a lot of stuff for the birds to play with, for them to interact with, because we need to give them what's called enrichment, stuff to do, stuff to think about. We also have to provide a space for them to try and have babies. So they have little nest boxes in there, covered areas so they can get out of the sun. But it's not a lot of trees in there because then we couldn't find the birds. We do have to monitor them. I don't think you can see it on the birds, but they have a little ankle bracelet with their name tag on it so that we know which bird is which. And we do have to do with like a census. We count them and we record every bird that's in the aviary pretty frequently. So we know that the birds that are in the aviary are the ones that were supposed to be there, but also that there's not any missing or injured birds. So our staff are in there sometimes with a clipboard, a pen, and a bunch of birds hanging out on top of them because they love the birds. And they're recording which birds are which. And it can take some time. Now, one of my friends, Amanda, is the one of the aviculturists that's in there. And she did the video for us. But she also will spend a lot of time 
monitoring and checking on her birth. All right. Okay, so we don't have it with you right now. That's okay. So we'll get to more bird stuff later. Don't worry. All right, so those are the birds that kind of live in and out of the aquarium, but there's also some other birds that we don't get to talk about too often. Uh, we have some shorebirds, and I have a couple examples of shorebird artifacts too. Let's take a look at them. So I have this skull. This is from something called a blue heron. Now, I don't think we have a picture of a blue heron, but we do have pictures of birds similar to a blue heron. Now, take a look at this, this parrot beak, because the, the lorikeet is a type of parrot. Let's, let's compare some of what they're doing. So this bird has a very different face than this bird. Let's just let's turn to the same way. There we go. Yeah, hold on. Yeah, that's not the same at all. Why are their beaks so different? What do you think is the reason that their beak is so curved? Emily's writing down a couple questions, so while we think about that, I'm going to see what Emily's question is. But take a look again at the blue heron skull versus a parrot skull or head. What are some other differences, you know? So very long. The color of the beak is different. Their beaks are orange. Um, not a very wide head. This tells us a lot about where the bird might be eating or what it might be eating. Now, our rainbow lorikeets... Even though they're parrots, they don't eat a lot of hard seed material or uh, grains of that kind of sort. What they're eating is instead either nectar from flowers and plants. They might chew on the flowers. They eat pollen. They might eat a few small insects here and there. But our diet for them includes like a fruit and vegetable smoothie in the morning, in the evening. And they get liquid nectar throughout the day, which is a special mixture that we can provide for them. And it gives them all of their nutrients. And it's similar to what they would be getting if they're out in their home habitat and the kind of things they'd be consuming out there. And uh, there's a couple of cool, cool questions. Hold on, let me talk about what this thing eats. So this eats very different stuff. This bird eats fish. How would you eat fish with such a skinny beak? They'll swallow them whole, but what they have to do is they have to catch them. So if you imagine, we're gonna we're gonna play act as a heron. They bend their arm. They're looking for food. When they dive into the water, they extend their neck all the way out. And that way they can plunge into the water very fast speeds. And it allows them to catch their food. And they'll come up to the surface. They'll swallow their food whole. So they're not really tearing it apart. Whereas a beak like this is designed to help tear and break things apart. Now, since they're eating flowers, not a lot to tear apart. But the lorikeets also will dig. So they will burrow into trees or logs so they can dig into the ground. So their beak helps a lot with that too. So when we look at feathers, we can kind of tell a little bit about the bird's habitat, what they might be doing or where they live. When we look at the beak shape, that tells us a little bit more about what they might be eating and their role in their environment. All right, Alex and Olivia, I think you've asked questions here before, Alex and Olivia. Welcome back. How do we take care of our lorikeets? Is that what you're asking ours? Okay, well, our lorikeets, they are a subtropical bird. So it, the temperature here is warm enough most of the year. But we also have a couple of overhangs and enclosures for them. We call it the hut out there in their exhibit in the aviary. And if it's really cold for California, there's heat lamps that turn on. And they'll all hang out near the heat lamps so they can stay warm. And we have areas that they can get out of the rain, get out of the wind. So we take care of them like a lot of birds that would naturally live around this area. Because a lot of their habitat is similar to California. But like I said, they're kind of a rainforesty bird, so a little bit more greenery than California might naturally have. All right. Oh, Jen did find the Howdy Hut video. So here's, here's inside the aviary. They're social birds. They hang out together. So we also don't want to really restrict where they're going. We let them hang out wherever they need to inside the aviary. And this is just one of the overhangs inside this entire exhibit. So you'll see like cardboard pieces down here. You'll see toys hanging around. And we just let the birds be birds in there. Now this video doesn't have the audio, but they can be pretty loud, especially during feeding time. It's, it's audible. It's audible everywhere you're outside if it's feeding time in the lorikeet aviary. They are that loud. Thanks for uh, helping show that off, Jen. Uh, we have a couple more questions. Are all the puffins 
of ours different species. There are a number of puffin species out there. So we have two species of puffins here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. There's even more that live in the Northern Hemisphere. And I don't even know all of their names, but there's a lot of different species of puffins. And they have very similar body shapes, similar feather styles. So here's a, another picture of the horned puffin. So a lot of them have this very stout, thick body. They have really tall, thick beaks because of the way that they carry their food. So their beaks are designed to carry a lot of food at once, and they'll carry back up to the surface. Instead of being something like a heron, where a heron won't dive 100 feet in the water to get to the food, it will dive and just get the food straight out of the surface of the water. So it doesn't need as thick of a beak to carry all of its food. Um, all right. Oh, Emily said there's four species of puffins. Okay, so there's four total species of puffins, but if you look at the entire auk family, there's even more species. Thank you, Emily. Uh, AJ's asking, why are the rainforest birds more colorful? All right, so this bird would not necessarily camouflage in a rainforest. Rain what colors do you think a rainforest has? Think of a forest. Pretty green and leafy, right? Lots of colorful flowers. So if you had a lot of colors on your body, you might blend in with the colors, the fruits, the, a lot of the different things that exist in a rainforest that look similar to this bird. But the other advantage to camouflage is that sometimes it breaks up the outline of your body. So if this bird were sitting in the trees, in the leaves, the changes in colors, the blotchy patterns will help break up the outline. So you couldn't be like, that's a bird. Like, well, I think there could be a bird there, but there's, I mean, there's the right colors, but I can't really see the shape of a bird. So camouflage also helps break up the shape so you can't really tell that it is that thing. Good question, AJ. Uh, all right, uh, Jove, welcome back, Jove. Do birds like penguins take naps? Yes, they do. They are such sleepy birds. So we'll actually watch the birds fall asleep sometimes. We've seen the lorikeets fall asleep, the penguins fall asleep sometimes. If uh, I think Jen's looking for our penguin webcam and you could probably on the webcam see the birds that are resting and sleeping. Now, they will lay down to sleep. They're not quite going to stay asleep standing up all the time. Sometimes they do. But they rest and they sleep a lot like we do. So their brains are actually very large compared to their body size. And so there's probably a lot more information moving inside their brain than we think there is. So they do rest and sleep similarly to us. And uh, I don't know how long they might sleep in, sleep in any given day, but penguins will spend a lot of time in the water. They spend over the whole course of their life probably three quarters of it in the water. So I don't think they're going to be sleeping in the water very much. That's not the easiest thing to do. All right. Uh, Genevieve and TT are asking, what do lorikeets look like as babies? Nothing like this. They are cute when they're babies and they don't really eat quite the same. Well, they do kind of eat the same stuff that our, our adults eat. So when bird birds are babies, this is a general rule. The parents will feed them and it's what the parents ate and they kind of hold it in a crop in the gizzard area where it's kind of pre-digested, not really digested, and they will spit it into the baby's mouth. That's how birds do the thing that birds do. So they kind of eat the same thing as the adults, but they, ate, they eat what the adult ate that's been a little bit digested. Um, but what they look like is not colorful at all. They're kind of gray. There's not a lot of things that you can see on them. And when they grow up, they start to get these very bright colors. So when they're younger, they have uh, kind of the grayish undercoat for feathers. I do have some lorikeet feathers we can look at. Do you want to look at some feathers with me? All right. I have a special camera that we can go over to that we can look at their feathers real quick. All right. Now their feathers, we do collect them every once in a while. I don't think we have any juvenile feathers in here, but you can kind of see the color differences in the feathers. So let's go over to our special camera and let's take a look at some feathers. All right, let's take a look at a couple different ones. Uh, I like that one. And All right, let's zoom in on some of these feathers. Ooh, I love this camera. I can zoom in so far. So feathers are similar to hair. They're not quite the same structure, but they're similar. So we can see just in this one feather, there's multiple colors, which allows for the birds to get some of the coloration they have. Let's zoom out a little bit. Let's take a look at 
our next one. Maybe we turn you over this way. Nope, oh, it's darker on that side. Oh, that's a good observation we just made. All right. Feather keeps wanting to fall over. All right, let's do this. I'm going to need to increase the brightness so we can see a little bit of the green right here on the on the bottom. We have this yellow patch. Now, these are all lower heat feathers. Now, on the other side of this feather, I don't see any green. Do you? There's a little bit of... That's not, it's orange. That's the orange from the other feather. Never mind. So on either side of the feather, we can also see differences in the coloration. All right. Now this last one is this little bit shorter feather. It's very fluffy, so it wants to fly away in the air conditioning. I'm sorry, I'm trying to position it correctly. Here we go. I got to keep my finger on it, otherwise it'll just blow over. But we can see kind of the little gray, fluffy little bits at the end, or towards where the root would be. And then we have this bright green coloring towards the end of the feather. So that is lorikeet feathers. And this will help us lead into penguin feathers, because we gotta talk, we got to talk about penguins too. So I'm going to stay at the camera, and I'm going to grab a couple of penguin feathers. All right, so here's my hand. We're still at the camera. We might have to make it a little bit darker. Let's make it a tiny bit darker. Okay. All right, now Archer was asking how penguins stay warm, and this is partly how that works. So Archer asked a great question that we are leading into right now. Let's zoom in. All right. Here is a penguin feather. Looks quite a bit different than those other feathers, doesn't it? Now, these are nice little fluffy feathers that will probably blow away too. So I'm going to hold on to that one. Let's try and add another one or two to our bunch here we go penguin feathers now this fluffy nature to them creates a nice barrier that what archer was asking about is how do they stay warm part of that is because these feathers are so densely packed together remember density is a lot of the the material that are stuck together in a small space so remember 10 jelly beans spread out 10 jelly beans tucked together so told you they blow away <laughs> so uh same number of particles but it's in a smaller amount of space so instead of having 10 feathers spread out 10 feathers stuck together real tightly the density of feathers that are all nice and fluffy like this creates creates this barrier on their body that doesn't allow water to touch the skin that's really cool now jen said the penguin cam is ready so let's take a look at the penguin cam i'm gonna put the feathers away so they don't blow blow away they're so light that they will literally just fly off the camera. Sleepy bird. I think it's actually lay, laying on the rock. And, you know. I'm just going to, I just got to watch this bird sleep on the rock. This is great. They're so cute. So the penguins have feathers. You can see the outlines of the feathers. And those feathers are so dense. There's so many of them. Penguins have the most feathers of any bird per square inch of skin. And it creates this layer that acts like a wetsuit. Actually, it's more like a dry suit. So a wetsuit keeps you warm, but your skin's wet. A dry suit keeps you warm, but your skin's dry. So they have a suit of feathers that keep them from getting cold. They also have a little bit of blubber, which is a specialized fat layer that will help keep them warm too. So that's how penguins are staying warm. Great question, Archer. All right, uh, let's see. Austin and Austin's mom are watching. Thank you for watching. What do the nests look like? I don't know if we still have our nest cam, but we did have uh, a nest for our penguins. Oh, the lorikeet nest? Okay, Emily th th thinks you're asking about lorikeet nests. Well, we can compare them, which is cool too. The penguin nest, they will, these are the lorikeets. The penguin nest will have, uh, we put like big leaf fronds from trees in there and they'll take them and it looks like giant blades of grass and they'll kind of stuff them together into a space that looks like a bird's nest but it's inside uh literally an animal carrier that's behind the scenes and it comes up to the wall so what that penguin was sleeping against looked like the doorway to a nest box and it is going to have a lot of those leafy materials in there the lorikeets however the lorikeets have a little bit different design to their nest they do kind of gather materials together but if we didn't coat the ground with certain materials they would dig into the ground of the mud and would just nest in there the other way that they will nest is that the lorikeets will dig into things and they'll put stuff together now this is an actual nest 
of a penguin in nature. So our penguins, their nests are behind the scenes, so they can kind of go away if they need to, if they want to just be on their own. But in nature, they'll kind of burrow a little bit into the ground. And a lot of penguins do that. They will just nest straight into the ground, and that's how they would build their nest out in their home habitat. Now, this is the Magellanic penguin. So they're nesting in South America. I forget which region of South America, but they do nest in South America in temperate climate, just like California. So imagine California, but in the Southern Hemisphere, that's what their habitat looks like. Our penguins can have an open air habitat. We don't have to have it refrigerated or air conditioned so that they stay cold all the time. Other species are like that, but the Magellanic penguin, we can have outside like our camera was showing you, and they can nest right into the sides of the exhibit space. So lorikeet nests and penguin nests have similarities. They will, lorikeets sometimes will dig into the ground, but the penguins can't fly, so they're not going to go up in the trees to nest. They have to nest in the ground. All right. Uh, let's see. Whose questions haven't I answered yet? Trevor and Matthew, can you show baby penguin pictures? There is a baby pe penguin picture. We're going to find it for you because they are, like any bird, they're very different looking from their adult counterparts. And they're fluffier. The colors of the, of the initial set of feathers are not the same. So here's a very new baby penguin. Not so new that they are, look almost bald. Once again, they're very brand new. When they just hatched, they kind of look bald. They get their first layer of feathers. And they're very fluffy, downy looking feathers. So down is a light fluffy feather that's usually underneath some of their other feathers. And when they grow up, they start to develop a different coat or different coloration or plumage. And then they have what's called the juvenile plumage. So they're kind of silvery on their back and light on their belly. That's the Magellanic penguin anyways. And then when they're adults, they get the black and white coloring. Uh, all right. Luca was asking, what sounds do penguins make? Depends on the penguin, but they, uh, they don't make sounds like we think of. They make some very interesting sounds. The penguins, the Magellanic penguins kind of bray like a donkey or almost, it's like if you mix the sound of a donkey and a goose together, it's kind of like that. It's a weird sound, but it's really cool. Sometimes if I, if it's late at night when I was working here and I would pass by the penguins and I heard them bray, I'd bray at them and they'd talk back to me. We had great conversations. Um, the bird, oh, Trevor and Matthew had a second question. Do birds have toenails? They, they do have claws. They don't really have toenails like we do. So they're not wide and flat, but they're sharp and long. The penguins don't have very long toenails. They're, they're much shorter claws, but it does help them to probably build their nest and dig it out a little bit. Same with their beak will help with that too. Uh, Legacy asked, how do birds get their names like the puffin, the heron, or the lorikeet? Uh, well, with birds... The lorry birds, it's a group of birds, the lorries. Now, keet in a lot of bird terms means a smaller version. So like a parakeet, it's a very small parrot. A lorikeet is a small lorry. As far as how the puffins and the herons got their name, I'm not sure the history of that. Now, the common names are often describing what they look like, their region, sometimes even just characteristics of their body. Like there's the six gill shark. That's the common name. It has six gills. Um, so common names vary quite a bit, sometimes region to region, but the scientific name they pick, they try to describe the parts of the animal or where it was found or who discovered it using Latin and Greek terms and, and sometimes eating, uh, adding some English and other terms into it. But it's this special name that is the same everywhere, whereas common names change from place to place. Um, so some of them, yes, they are named after people that have discovered them. I don't know who discovered some of them, but a lot of times their name fits into it. And so that's usually how you can tell that. Uh, Rex was asking, where do penguins nest? I think we got to all of that, Rex. Hopefully we answered your question. Penguins have to nest in the ground or like the, uh, there's a lot of same. The emperor penguin doesn't really build a nest because they live in the snow of Antarctica. So they can't really dig into the ground. So what they do instead is they bounce an egg on their feet. Now, Emily likes to tell people to practice this. If you had like a little water balloon about the size of your, both of your hands and you balanced it on your feet, they don't have any eggs in their feet, but these are the babies of the emperor penguin. I can just imagine this one's just like looking up like, mom, you didn't give me any fish yet. And mom's just like, I'm, I can't deal with that right now. But there's a lot of babies in here. Look at how different the coloring of the plumage of the babies are compared to the adult emperor penguins. 
and they hold the egg right there on their feet, both their little feet, because they don't want the egg to get cold, so it stays warm on the penguin's feet. Now, the fun thing for penguins is that when they take, they take turns, so one penguin will stay with the egg, and the other a parent will go out and find food. And then they have to trade places. So the one that was finding food comes back to its mate with the egg, trades who has the egg, and then it, the one that was holding the egg goes and hunts. But they can't let the egg touch the snow. So how do they trade the egg between their feet? It's pretty tough. You could try it if there's somebody uh, in the house with you that wants to try and practice that. You could do a water balloon. You could do like a little ball. Try and trade who's holding it on their toes. Uh, why are penguins' feathers so tiny? The size does vary. So there's a few different sizes of feathers. That's a great question. But the smaller nature of them allows them to overlap in a higher density than some of the other birds. The other thing is um, I have some flight feathers of other birds. So here is a really big feather from a different bird. This is not a penguin feather. So the really long feathers that we often see left behind by birds uh, out in, you know, our backyards, out in the woods, what have you. Those are often flight feathers, tail feathers, and it helps so that they can fly. Well, penguins don't fly, so they don't need those really big feathers hanging off of their wings. Imagine, if, like, the, every image you ever see of, like, a hawk or a falcon flying around or an eagle has huge feathers hanging off of their wings. That helps create the gliding and lift, so when they fly, they can get lift or they can glide while they're up in the air. But penguin wings have even smaller feathers because they're not flying in the air. They're flying underwater. So they still flap their wings to move. But they don't need the big fluffy feathers to create the same effect. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, so much. Oh, what's going on with our penguin cam? Oh, they moved. He's, he's not sleeping on the rock anymore. We were checking in on the penguins because uh, we didn't want that penguin to fall asleep too much. They need to be very active during the day. No, it's okay. They can nap whenever they want to. All right. We are out of time. Thank you, everybody. Oh, we do have a couple more questions. I'm going to get to uh, Maeli's question. I hope I said that right. I'm sorry if I did not. Do puffins and penguins have anything in common? They eat similar foods. They have similar colors. So they have similar styles of, like a similar style of bird, but the puffin can fly. The penguin cannot. And remember, the difference is that puffins are in the northern hemisphere and penguins are in the southern hemisphere. And they don't really crisscross because the middle of the planet, the equator, is really warm. They're not tropical birds. They're not going to cross from a very cold habitat to a very warm habitat to get to a very cold habitat again. So they don't really crisscross. They will probably never meet each other in nature. They might here at the aquarium, but they probably won't meet each other in nature. Now, Olive did ask, do lorikeet feathers look different as they get older? Not as far as I know. They don't get uh, gray or change coloring from adult to old age. So remember, they change from baby to juvenile, a young bird, to the adult. And then the colors pretty much stay the same from there. Now, that may be different for certain species of birds. But as far as I know, the lorikeets have the same beautiful colors from the time that they first get all those beautiful colors and for the rest of their life. Great question, Olive. All right. Keep tuning in today. We have a lot of great programming on our Tuesday today. So we're going to be talking a lot about mammals and conservation and trying to help our various animals. We also have a moving and grooving class coming up later this morning, where if you want to help dance like the animals, get up and out of your chairs a little bit, tune in because Jen's going to be teaching that. Thank you, everybody, and have a good rest of your Tuesday. No, today's Wednesday. Excuse me. <laughs>